we might show up at a protest and it might be a two hour protest and it's people standing around for an hour and 58 minutes and then there's two minutes where you know, there's a little fight or people get really excited or agitated and we photograph that two minutes out of two hours and then that one photo of that two minute runs in the newspaper as the representation of what happened at the two hour event. And that's total bullshit. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Photo Forward podcast, where we explore the stories behind some of the greatest visual storytellers in the world. From their photographic origins to finding work-life balance as creative professionals, to how to actually make a living as a photographer, videographer, or multimedia creator, we're going to uncover what makes them tick and their shutters click. I'm your host, Ben Brewer. Today's episode is a big one. Today we're talking with a true veteran photojournalist, the great Scott Strizanti. After spending the first 27 years of his career at Chicago newspapers, including 13 at the Chicago Tribune, Scott Strizanti joined the photography staff at the San Francisco Chronicle in 2014. Scott is a former POY and NPPA National Newspaper Photographer of the Year, an 11-time Illinois Photographer of the Year, and was part of the Chicago Tribune team that won a Pulitzer in 2007 for investigative journalism. Scott's personal project, Common Ground, has been featured in National Geographic, Mother Jones, the New York Times Lens blog, and CBS Sunday Morning. The 23-year-long effort, which has won BOP's Best Feature Video and POYI's Community Awareness Award, became his first book with PSG. And in October 2017, Scott's second book, Shooting from the Hip, was released. The book consists of iPhone hipstamatic snaps from around the USA. In today's episode, we dive in deep on the practicals of getting started and staying motivated on a very long-term documentary project, how a kid from the south side of Chicago got connected with some of the greatest photographers out there, and why getting creatively bored, yes, bored, is the best way to rethink your photographic style and technique. You can find show notes with the photos we're talking about and links online at photoforward.media slash podcast slash Scott. So without further ado, our interview with Scott Strizanti. Scott Strizanti, welcome to the Photo Forward podcast. Ah, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Well, people may have seen some of your work just recently, uh, covering a lot of the Golden State Warriors basketball. So have you uh, recovered slightly from the, the craziness that has been that? Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's like I got to San Francisco in 2014, and I've gone to the NBA Finals with the Warriors every single year since I've been here. And so it's kind of funny, like the sports photographers here are like, oh, you're a good luck charm. Thanks for coming, you know. So it's been, it's been really interesting. I covered the uh, Chicago Bulls in the Michael Jordan days. So so this was my 10th NBA final that I covered. And, wow. and so it's been a lot of fun for sure. It, it never gets old. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think we're going to, we'll get into kind of your moving out to, to San Francisco, uh, you know, about four years ago, but I kind of want to, I want to go back. We'll kind of do things a little, a little out of order. So I was first introduced to your work uh, way back when I was interning uh, with Jerome Polis uh, out in Northern Idaho. And sure. And I got started, you know, that was my first internship. Um, and really early on, he said, you know, go check out uh, Scott Strizanti Common Ground. And that was pretty much all he said. He's just go Google it. You'll <laughs> you watch it. See what you think. Um, and that really, you know, got me started as sort of like, oh, this is this is what kind of real, you know, photojournalism is. So kind of alluding to it. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on Common Ground uh, and what it is? Sure. So um I got into the newspaper business in the late 80s. I had no formal training. I went to a liberal arts college. Um, and my first job out of uh, college, which was I kind of got a, it was kind of a fluke that I got an actual job in newspapers. But it was just a, a very small community paper um, on the one of the south suburbs of Chicago. And it wasn't a great visual newspaper. I shot a lot of sports. Um, I probably did five, six assignments a day. Um, so they were just like cranking them out. And and I, I had no experience at all doing photo stories. And so in 1994, so I'd been at the paper for five, six years at this point, I, I got one of the typical assignments that they would give at this newspaper. It's like, OK, we're doing a story on people who raise animals um, in this one township 
near the circulation area. And so we're going to spend you to send you out to spend two hours with a guy who raises wolves. And then we're going to send you out for two hours to photograph someone who raises llamas. And then there's a, a horse farm. And then the final stop was I was supposed to spend two hours um, on this cattle farm run by Harlow and Gene Cagwin. And when I first got on the farm, I was struck by just like, how run down the place was. The barns were falling apart. You know, there was like three feet of manure everywhere. Um, Harlow was 71 at the time. His wife was in her early 60s. And and they were really sweet to me, but you could tell that it was a struggle. And, and so the assignment was just to kind of get a feel for what they were doing. So I photographed them um, tending to their cattle. And, you know, just that was about it. And as I was leaving, being a city boy, I really enjoyed my time visiting with them on the farm. I just kind of offhandedly said, hey, can I come back and visit sometime? And they were like, sure, that's fine. Um, probably assuming that I never would come back. Uh, but then a couple um, weeks later, I stopped by. And, and then like a month later, I stopped by. And, and, and it ended up I really wasn't doing much photography. It just be kind of came a social thing. I'd come and Harlow and Jean would stop working. And we'd go in their kitchen and Jean would make some dessert for us. And we'd sit there and chat. And then my kids um, were born right around that time. So I started bringing them to the farm um, to show them the cattle. And, and they had a lot of cats on the farm. And so kind of from 94 to about 98, it, I really didn't photograph much on the farm. I would hang out a lot um, and occasionally make photos. But, you know, it, at that point, it wasn't anything. It was just more like someplace that I would go and hang out. And then in 1998, I switched to another newspaper in Joliet, Illinois, the Herald News. And that paper was incredibly visual. And not only did they assign long-term stories, you know, it was expected that the photographers were self-generate most of them. And so I had no experience at all self-generating stories. So I just kind of said, hey, I, I know these cattle farmers. Maybe I can uh, do a story on them. And I'm like, sure, that sounds great. And so I had to go back and literally tell Gene and Harlow, hey, you know, I love hanging out with you guys, but I want to actually do a photo story on you now and take photos. And the interesting thing was John Lowenstein, who is an amazing photographer, he was working um, at the time at a weekly in that area. And he'd actually photographed Gene and Harlow for a little story for their newspaper. So um, Gene and Harlow were used to being photographed. And, and so I started photographing them. And it was it was a really great place for me to learn long-term storytelling because every day was the same thing. Um, they were, you know, get up at the same time and check on the cattle and, you know, just kind of, it was just a very, you know, routine way of life. So I would photograph him like branding cattle one day and I just wouldn't, it wouldn't be very good. So the next day I would come out and shoot it differently or I'd do something at a different time of the day or a different lens. And I just kind of started perfecting images and, and I, I really had no idea yet what the idea of the story was. I thought it was just going to be a day in the life of two cattle farmers. But then Harlow's health started deteriorating. He had carpal tunnel syndrome. He had asthma. He had arthritis. And then um, a lot of the farms around the Cagwood farm started being sold to subdivision developers. And so it was kind of something where Harlow and Gene didn't want to leave the farm. But Harlow had three siblings who had grown up on the farm, and they kind of were in their you know late 60s, early 70s. And and they were hoping to sell the farm and get some money so they could enjoy their, their senior years. And so it took maybe about two, three years, and a subdivision developer approached Gene and Harlow, and they finally ended up selling their farm. And at that point, I just was then photographing um, you know, their kind of daily life as they got ready to, ready to leave the farm. The, they actually lived on the farm for about a year while they started building the subdivision around them. And so I figured at the end... When they left, that would be the end of the story. And the newspaper, the Herald News, did a couple stories on it. But then, before the, the Cagwins left their farm, I got a job at the Chicago Tribune. And so I brought the, the story along with me to the Chicago Tribune. And then finally, on July, um, I think it was July 2nd, 2002, um, the Cagwins left the farm for the final time. And, and basically, they, they moved out and they started tearing the house down, like, five minutes after they moved. And so it was just a really emotional day. And I got this really nice photo of Harlow. Not nice. It's, it's funny how photographers, we kind of, <laughs> you know, like really sad, dramatic photos. Like, oh, it was a nice photo. You know, but anyway, so it was like, it, like, it was a moment that kind of capsulized, you know, the years of struggle. It was Harlow with his head down on this log in his front yard while his home was, was being knocked down behind him. And so at that point, I'd photographed the story for eight years. 
Um, it had been published in three different newspapers. It was part of my portfolio that won National Newspaper Photographer of the Year in 2000. And so at that point, I thought, well, you know, this is it. The story's over. And Harlow and Jean um, bought another house on a farm, which they they weren't they they leased the land and they were just retiring. So I didn't really feel like I wanted to photograph them anymore. And so I just kind of went back to my normal newspaper life. And then for some reason, I just kind of felt like there was something more to the story. So I would go back to the subdivision that was being built, and I photographed the construction, and I photographed some of the model homes going up. And at that time, I said, I think I would like to try to find a family in the subdivision, and maybe they would have, like, cow salt and pepper shakers. You know, that would be, like, the one thing that could tie it together, like, showing that this used to be a cattle farm. And so I, I met a couple people, and and I had one family. The It was a young couple, and the woman was pregnant, and they had seen the story in the Chicago Tribune. And I asked if I could document them as they lived their life, and they agreed. But I just it just never kind of worked out for me, I guess. I, I never went back to visit them. It just things were too busy. I, I don't know exactly what happened. It just kind of seemed like nothing would happen. And so then 2003 became 2004, became 2005, became 2006, and I really hadn't photographed much at all. And then one day I was showing um, my work to a, a photo class at this place called College of DuPage, which is um, a community college outside Chicago. And it was you know half adults, half college-age students. And as part of my presentation, I showed about 50 photos from the farm, and I talked about what it was now. And a woman raised her hand in the class and said, I live in that subdivision. And I was like, really? And it ended up being Amanda Grabenhofer. And um, she invited me to visit her home and her family on a Saturday when they were having an Easter egg hunt. It was right before Easter. And Amanda was married. She had four kids. Three of them were triplets. She had a dog that looked like a cow. It was just like this perfect suburban life. And, and because like the whole cul-de-sac they lived on was there for the Easter egg hunt. I was able to like get verbal permission from every parent. You know, I told them what, what I did, what I was doing. And so I would just kind of then hang out and I would just, I photographed much more in the subdivision than I ever did on the farm. Um, there was so much more going on. You know, I, when I was on the farm, it was weird. I would only go on Mondays and I would just photograph, you know, on Mondays because that was my day off. Because it, This turned into a personal project, even though I was doing it for newspapers um, I wanted to retain ownership of it. So I started just shooting it with my own cameras and on my own personal time. And I, I, I kind of let, um, you know, the newspapers publish it because they would sometimes let me work, you know, during company hours or the Chicago Tribune. Actually, I was using film, their film. My boss let me use film there. So they they, they supported the project, but I still wanted to retain ownership. And so then you know, I started photographing on the subdivision and I really didn't know how I was going to make it work. Um, but one day, pretty early on, I photographed this photo of um, Ben, their oldest son, and his cousin CJ um, wrestling on the ground with his jump rope. And it reminded me of a photo I'd made on the farm of Harlow wrestling with a day old calf with a big rope. And, and so that night I, I put those photos together as diptychs or pairings. And at that point I was like, yeah, this is how I can tell the story. I can, you know, have the farm on the left, the subdivision on the right. And at that point, um, I was, you know, I would, I would never like look for anything, but things would always kind of just pop up. Like I, you know, one of the little girls would be mowing the lawn with a toy lawnmower. And then I'd be like, Oh, I know I have a photo of Harlow mowing his hay. And, and then, you know, one day the, the Amanda's parents were there with their dogs and they were feeding them. And I, I knew I must have some cow photo and, and that was where they were being fed. So I just kind of kept piecing these things together. And it actually, you know, the project at that point, kind of the pairings really came together quickly and naturally. And, and so it was crazy. So my first day in the subdivision was March of 2007. And in February 2008, I had four pages in National Geographic. So it went from like me not knowing what I wanted to do with it to like all of a sudden it just kind of being this full formed idea. And then um, all these other things happened. I went to the mountain workshops as a coach and I, I showed the diptychs for the first time. And one of the coaches there was a guy named Chad Stevens, who was this amazing uh, multimedia producer. And he was working at MediaStorm at the time. And he asked me if I'd shown it to Brian Storm yet, his boss. 
And I knew Brian, but I hadn't shown him the work yet. And he, when he saw it, he was like, holy shit, this is amazing. He's like, this is what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the video you've shot, you know, get to give me your interviews, you know, and I'm like, video interviews? What are you talking about? I, I just like, I've just been doing stills. And he's like, oh, you know, you photographers, you know. And so at that point, I had to start thinking outside of, you know, just still photography. Although, although I didn't, I didn't do anything more than still photography. I actually just hired a guy I was working with, Wes Pope, and he did video and we did a bunch of interviews and, and then multi um, media storm ended up putting together a little seven minute piece, um, that, that, that debuted at look three in 2009, I believe. Uh, no, actually it was 2008. It was, I think it was June of 2008. And then I you know, said, well, maybe I'll do a book. And so then I did a Kickstarter and raised about $50,000. And so it was kind of crazy. Like this thing started as just a two hour assignment. And then it became just a place I visited. And then it just kind of started rolling downhill and gathering momentum. And I never had a plan for it to be anything more than just kind of a, a photo oasis for me. And it just ended up turning to all these things. And it kind of has become, you know, what my career is best known for. And and so, like, I always recommend to photographers just find a personal project and and work on that. And, you know, it doesn't even matter what it is. It could be your family. It could be a park. It could be, you know, it could be anything. It could be, you know, this guy, Pete Maravich, I know. You know, he started a personal project on um, cities, coal, I mean, uh, steel towns in, outside of Pittsburgh where he grew up that have, you know, started deteriorating. And so that's like his personal project. And so it's like, you know, it's like for me, I love newspapers, but after a while, it just gets to be so redundant and you're shooting the same parade year after year or you're, you know, you're doing the same things that I always want to have something that I'm working on as a side project. And sometimes it's more than just a side project. Like now I stay sane by doing iPhone street photography. And that's kind of where I get my kind of creative release when I have a week or two weeks where I have nothing but boring non-visual assignments, you know, I'll, I'll do more street photography. And then the weeks where I actually have really good assignments, I'll do less. And, and so for me, it's like photography kind of is my hobby and my career. So I, I definitely, you know, want to stay evolving. I want to stay fresh and relevant. So I just don't ever want to get to a point where I burn out and, and projects like common ground and, and my book, my new book, shooting from the hip, you know, those are things that, that I do to just stay fresh. So my day job doesn't become boring. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And I want to, I'll talk more about uh, shooting from the hip. I definitely want to touch on that a lot and going back to common ground. So how, how did you kind of maintain that sort of momentum over years? Cause it's, it's a long project. And I think, you know, a lot of younger photographers, they'll get started on something. They'll maybe shoot a little bit, six months go by and it just, it, you know, that momentum fades. How did, how did you kind of keep, uh, you know, keep going on that over, over that many years. Yeah. Well, I think for me, it's like, I did have big gaps where I didn't photograph there, but also I think it was key to kind of have the newspaper, you know, be part of it and, and them wanting to do stories on it because that kind of gave me deadline pressure because I think if the newspaper, um, first the Herald news, I mean, first the daily South town and the Herald news and the Chicago tribune, if they hadn't assigned writers to do stories on it, I might've let it slip even more. And so it was really, um, you know, that was a good kind of uh, momentum for me to, to keep going on it. But also after about, you know, the last two years, there were so many things going on where, you know, the, the barns were being torn down or they had to go to a meeting to have the, you know, the sale approved or, you know, whatever. Like at that point, there was things that that I could actually shoot that were just one of a kind things instead of just their, their normal daily life. And yeah, so I'm not, you know, it definitely was sporadic where sometimes I would go, you know, four or five Mondays in a row. And then sometimes I would go two months. And, um, so it definitely, you know, without shooting there. So it, it, it definitely was something that it was always there so I could go on my time. And, and so those always tend to be the type of stories I do where, you know, if I have a free hour or I have an entire day, you know, or I don't have any time in two weeks, you know, it's always going to be there. And so I, I tend to like to do stories that, you know, where I can just pop in and pop out. And it doesn't even matter if I go six months without shooting there. Yeah, yeah, it is uh, pretty important to just be able to, to do it whenever possible, really, and just kind of stay connected with it. So 
So you mentioned some of the newspapers you worked at, you know, it was all kind of Chicago areas and you, and you grew up in the Chicago area. Um, yes. Tell me about, uh, tell me about your first kind of uh, paid, paid photo thing, or kind of go take me back a little bit to like when that kind of clicked for you that, you know, I want to do photography. Yeah. So when I was a kid, um, I was a huge sports fan and uh, I was a, a fan of the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bears and the Blackhawks and, and my family, um, we went to a lot of games and, and so my dad was the photographer of the family. When we'd go on vacation, he had his Canon AE1 and he would, he would like, we would always laugh because every time we'd go through a national park, he would always end up getting a photo of the, the butt of an animal. Like he could never get the front side. It was like, we had this whole collection of like, here's an elk's ass, here's a bear's butt, here's, you know, and it was hilarious. It was like, he wasn't a talented photographer, but he liked, he liked to photograph things. And so when I started, you know, to get interested in Sports Illustrated magazine and and looking at sports photography, probably when I was around 12 or 13, um, I started borrowing his camera and shooting photographs from the stands. And, you know, at that point time, I was shooting with, you know, probably a 50 millimeter lens. And so I would I would photograph, you know, three or four rolls of film. I would get them processed and have prints made, little four by six prints. But the actual action would be like a half inch by a half inch, you know, so I would cut them out and I would put them in my a little photo gallery I and mean, like a photo book and photo album. And so I, I have to find them somewhere. I would have like 10 photos on each page, these tiny, tiny little actions. And and I never, ever thought of it as a career. But at one point I entered one of my baseball photos in the what was it? The first national bank of evergreen park photo contest. And, and I got an honorable mention and it was like, Oh my God, it was like the highlight of my young life. And, you know, and I, I was, I was the third child and I didn't get a lot of attention paid to me. So having like a little bit of attention to, for my photography, whatever dismal it was at the time was like, just so awesome. So I didn't really, you know, still think of it as a career, but I started photographing more. And when I went to college, my dad was a tire dealer and I was supposed to take over the family business and so I went to college to be a business major, but I started taking a lot of photographs um, just around um, campus in Wisconsin where I was. And, and I would take photos at frat parties. And, and I worked for the, the school newspaper for about a semester, but, you know, I, I kind of got bored with that. And um, so really, I, I had no plans at all. And then my junior year, um, I just stumbled upon a gallery show at, at my college. It was Ripon College. And this photographer, Paul Giroux, who was at the Chicago Tribune, had a gallery show of his work. And I can still remember like some of the photos. There was a photo from this high school, St. Francis de Sales, that was right near where I grew up. There was a, a photo story he had done on an old monk, you know. And so he had all these black and white photographs. And I, I was just basically like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to be a photojournalist. And so Paul was there and I worked up the courage to, to talk to him. And like a lot of young photographers do with me now, I, I did the same thing to him. I said, Paul, I want to do what you do. Tell me how I to do it, basically. You know, give me the secret recipe. Give me the shortcuts to how I become a, a photojournalist. And, and he was honest. He was like, well, you know, I, there's, I can't give you any advice, really. You just have to, um, you know, photograph a lot. And, you know, I went, you know, the one bit he gave me was like, oh, I went on this urban studies program and I had an internship at, at some book publishing company. And so then, of course, I like signed up for the urban studies program right away. And and I ended up interning at the city of Chicago photo department um, with the, the team of photographers that covered Harold Washington, um, Chicago's first African-American mayor. And so I think they let me photograph two days. And and but most of the time I just cut their negatives and I filed them. I make prints. And and so it was a really kind of a good introduction to you know what professional photographers do. And so then when I went back to college the next semester, I became an art major and I definitely started actively thinking, well, how do I become a photojournalist? And I got out of college and I sent out, I didn't even send out portfolios. I sent out a cover letter and a resume to all the newspapers in the Midwest. You know, it was like a laughable. And luckily, this guy, Irv Gebhardt at the Milwaukee Journal said, come on up, show me your work. And so I went up there and he was really sweet. And he was like, oh, it looks like you have a good eye, but you need more experience. You know, either get a job at a small paper or go back to school. And he said, there's this guy, John H. White in Chicago. He's an amazing Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. He teaches at Columbia College. You know, why don't you give him a call? Here's his number. 
And so I called John and he said, oh, well, you know, you don't have any experience. So you're going to have to take photo one and darkroom one before you can take my photojournalism class. And so I took those classes. And actually, before the class ended, um, I got a call from a tiny newspaper um, looking for a part time photographer. And they offered me four dollars and twenty five cents an hour. And I'd be working about 12 to 16 hours a week. And I said, yeah, this is it. And I, I quit school. I, you know, I, I never took John's class. I learned on the job by making mistakes. And, and then a year later, that newspaper got bought by the Daily South Town, a little bit bigger newspaper. And I just kind of kind of worked my way up. So it was a lot of total flukes, but also a lot of people who you know, gave me a step up, who shared you know, some information, who gave me a little direction. And, and so ever since then, my entire career, I never say no to any speaking engagement I always want, you know, any student who, you know, wants me to do an interview or wants me to look at their work, you know, I, I do it because you just never know which of them I'm going to inspire, you know, to, to become, you know, a photojournalist. And so I always am trying to, you know, pay it forward. And, and you, know, I, you know, I wouldn't be where I was at without the people who helped me along the way. So I always try to, you know, to kind of pay it back that way. Yeah, that is powerful. I mean, it is so... You know, that is such a small community that we are kind of a part of that it, it, it is so important to stay connected when it comes to like uh, younger photographers, I guess, since you've, you've interacted with a lot of younger photographers now, like what what do you see as like a mistake that you see all the time that you just that you want to you want to train out of them of younger photographers? I think, you know, definitely a lot of photographers, they, you know, they have this thing where. They don't fill the frame, you know, they kind of see a moment and then they'll photograph it and then they get it back and they'll just, you know, they'll have to, you know, crop it or, you know, they don't get close enough. They don't get low enough. You know, they just kind of, you know, and I was really timid when I was when I was starting out. So I totally understand it. But a lot of them are, are too timid. But it's interesting. It's, it, I think the young photographers now are so much better than young photographers when I was starting out, I, I don't know if it's just because it's a more visual world, because, you know, of camera phones, because of the Internet. Um, you know, for me, when I was first starting out, I, you know, I had to wait for the pictures of the yearbook or the World Press book to come out every year to see great photography. You know, now I could spend all day on the Internet just looking at um, you know, amazing photographers I've never heard of. And there's so many of them out there. Um, so I think, you know, studying other people's work and studying your own work it, it are things that I think are really important. Um, you know, I, I used to just stare at my photographs and just kind of like, well, why does this work? Why doesn't it work? Where does my eye go? Is it going where I want it to go? And, and so it, it's definitely a, a craft where you have to just do it over and over and over again. Although some people, you know, I, I, I worked with Rob Finch, who was photographer of the year twice before he was 25, you know, and so some people are kind of born with it, you know, and other people, it has to kind of be awoke within them. And then other people never get it, you know, so I think it's just teaching, you know, being taught something and hard work will get you just so far. But you know, the people who have the natural ability, and then somehow they realize it, and they also work really hard. I think those are the ones that are successful. And, you know, I would rather, I'd rather hire a young working, I mean, a hardworking photographer, who's not that talented than a lazy photographer who is incredibly skilled, you know? And so, you know, and I've worked with people like that who are just unbelievably talented, but they just, just could never seem to like, you know, get motivated or maybe it came too easy to them. I'm not sure, but it, it definitely, um, you know, I guess back to the question of, you know, what, what do young photographers do that, you know, that I, that, that I would try to change. You know, I, I think it's just work hard, be nice to people, listen to people, you know, stop talking and listen, you know, like most of the time people just want their story heard. And, and if you just look at them in their eye, listen to them, you know, mirror back to them, you know, that what they're saying is important. You know, there's so many doors that are open to you and, and don't feel entitled. Don't feel like, you know, you know, you deserve anything. It's like, you know, all my whatever accolades I've ever gotten in my life was because some photo subject agreed to let me spend time with them. And, and, and it's, it's definitely a skill that you can hone over time. And it, it's something that, that definitely, I think one of my favorite quotes was by Dave LaBelle. And he said, a great photojournalist is one third artist, one third detective and one third social worker. 
you know, and I thought that that was like really spot on. And, you know, it's, you know, photojournalism is very, has very little to do with photography. You know, obviously you have to, you know, have a camera and, and know how to work it. But, but, you know, photo, the journalist part of photojournalism has nothing to do with the technical aspects of it. It's about how you interact with people, how you see the world, you know, what you have passion for, you know, because it's, you know, there's a trillion choices, you know, every time you pick up the camera, whether where you want to stand, what lens you want to use, you know, what angle, what moment, you know. And so you have to kind of be able to know what a good photograph is before you can make a good photograph. That's, that is so important, I think. And that kind of, to some degree, I think that speaks to where one finds their sort of creative inspiration from. I think that, that do you have any, where do you kind of find your creative inspiration from? It's weird. It, it, it's kind of for me, like I, there was a long period of time where I just was on Instagram and I was looking, 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 looking at Instagram all the time. And, and you know, Facebook I do. But now it's weird. It's like I spend most of my time on Twitter and it's only because you know, Donald Trump infuriates me so much that I spend all my time on Twitter now looking for things, people criticizing Donald Trump. And it's like really bizarre and weird. And, and it's like, it does, it's, it's so unproductive, but it's just kind of such a weird time that we're in this world right now. And, you know, like if you like go on my Instagram, I like barely post on Instagram anymore. I'm just like, so, you know, kind of in this really weird space. And, um, so it, it's really, yeah, you know, I, I don't. I know a lot of other people are like that too. And you know, as a as a photojournalist, you know, I can't post anything on social media that's politically, you know, oriented, which is fine. Um, I don't really want to be out there, you know, doing that. But it's just a really weird, weird time. But I, when I first started out, I didn't want anyone else to make a good photograph. I wanted to take all the good photographs, and it would I would be really jealous, or I would I would get angry if I saw other people make really great photographs. And now I think I'm finally to a space where I can appreciate other people's photography and just the overabundance of accessibility to it, you know, is mind numbing at times, but it's also amazing. And, you know, I could, you know, tick off a thousand photographers that I enjoy their work and, um, you know, it just kind of depends on what mood I'm in. But, but I guess if I, ha if I had to choose one place um, to go, I would probably, you know, Instagram is, is it's an interesting you know, place it, you know, it has, you know, it, it's a little of everything. It's kind of a mishmash of things, but there is a lot of great photojournalism on there now too. But, but yeah, I, I definitely consume a lot of photography and, you know, I, I love long form documentaries. I'm not really into, you know, the shorter newspaper videos, although there's a lot of great work being done. And I'm not a great talent on the San Francisco Chronicle staff that does a lot of great work, but yeah, it's, it's photography is everywhere. So it's, you know, I rarely pick up a newspaper anymore, but I do get it delivered to my phone. So it's the first thing in the morning I do. I look at the, you know, the digital version of the newspaper because I love, I just kind of love the, you know, I'm old. So, yeah, you know, I'm ingrained in the newspaper world. So I love looking at photos in newspaper form almost better than in you know, just kind of on a website or, you know, just on Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, like that, uh, the idea of, not wanting other people to take good photos at first. Cause that's something that I, I know I struggled with early on. Like when I started doing more freelancing, the honest truth is, you know, I get frustrated when other people got assignments that I didn't, or I see someone doing other work. And at first it was, it was frustrating, but I think there's something to getting over that and, you know, appreciating the work that gets done. It's kind of that rising tide, you know, raises all boats sort of mentality that once you get away from that scarcity <laughs> mindset of, you know, it's okay that other people take good photos. Yeah, I, I think, you know, too, it's like I spent decades being a contest whore, you know, where I like just entered so many contests. I entered all the clip contests. I entered the earring contest. You know, I just wanted to win, 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 you know, and and it, it definitely was a time where you had to win photo contests to get your name out there, you know, because you really had no other choice. Um, but now it's like, I kind of, you know, I think this year was the first year I didn't enter a portfolio in POI since, you know, for like, geez, probably in the last 25 years, you know, and it just, all of a sudden I just kind of am over it, you know, and it's weird. It's like, I, you know, I, I definitely, you know, entered contests forever, but now I just kind of feel like it's like, eh, it's like, I guess, cause I have so many more venues to kind of self publish my work now that I don't really need to you know, put it in contest form anymore to, to have it. And plus it was much easier to win photo contests back, back when I was first starting out because 
there was so little representation from the world. You know, it was more like POI was mostly all American. And now, you know, it's all the contests are worldwide. And there's so many amazingly talented photographers and just like photographing so many things. It's, you know, and so maybe because I just stopped winning a lot, you know, I maybe that's one of the reasons I just I don't enter as much anymore, you know. So it's kind of, you know, it's definitely something that I find photo contest fascinating and i think if i was ever going to get like a master's or something i would love to do a thesis on on just photo contests and just kind of you know the judging of them and and the entering thing and just the whole psychological dynamics behind a contest because it is pretty fascinating and, and i've judged a lot of contests and i've entered more and it, i know it's a super subjective and just because you win doesn't mean you're best and just because you lose doesn't mean you're the worst but it's really hard to to get past that you know that kind of needing you know that the empty hole in you to be filled with with awards you know and i definitely went through a phase where i felt i was only a good photographer if i won an award and if i didn't then i had a bad year it was just really kind of it, it just definitely it's not a healthy thing i think for photographers but at some point it's a necessary evil yeah, I mean, yeah, contests are really their own. You could spend you could spend hours just talking about contests itself in terms of how one photo wins, and then all of a sudden, it seems like over the next year, you see a lot more photos that try to copy that exact style. Yep. Yeah. No, when I was early on, I would do that. If like the first place sports action photo was of a rodeo, I was like, I got to go shoot rodeos. Or if it, you know, if it was pee wee football, I was like, I need to do a pee wee football story. You know, it's like you kind of get this mindset of. You know, and I think that's another going back to one of your earlier questions is for young photographers is don't chase what other people are doing. You know, it's like try to find your own path, you know, try to photograph something that that you find interesting and kind of be a visual leader instead of a follower. And and, you know, I, I really never thought of it in that way. It wasn't the, the reason behind it. But I, I do have pride the fact that, you know, that I was one of the first photographers to be awarded for diptychs and then POI you know, does not allow diptychs anymore, you know, and, and, and then I started doing, I came late to the game on um, iPhone photography, but now I've kind of made it my own a little bit. And, and, you know, sometimes when you know people are like, Oh, who's the, you know, who's a good iPhone photographer, you know, like my name pops up and I've gotten jobs just because, you know, people say, Oh yeah, Scott's a good iPhone photographer. And so it, it definitely is something that, you know, I, I like following the new technological trends. And then when I do it, I, I don't want to repeat what someone else is doing. I just kind of want to do my own thing. And I think that's, you know, it's so important to just kind of trust your vision, although sometimes it's hard. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue into uh, into talking about uh, shooting from the hip and, and sort of getting into the world of iPhone and mobile phone photography, which kind of used to be a a dirty word around the, the photojournalism world. So Absolutely. tell me a little bit about how you got started with uh, shooting uh, in the mobile format and, and then going moving into shooting from the hip. Yeah, I remember back, I don't know what year it was. Um, it was Damon Winter, you know, shot what a hip thing in Afghanistan or Iraq. And it won like a third place in POI and everyone's head exploded. You know, it's like, oh my God, those are filtered images. That's not real photojournalism. And you know, that, 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 oh, that was just like crazy. And that was that was when I was at the Chicago Tribune. And I had a, a company issued BlackBerry, you know, so I wasn't really doing any any photography with my phone. But I, I was kind of part of that. Oh, that's, you know, the snobby like, oh, the iPhone is bad. And, you know, and, and but then um, I think it was sometime late 2011. I went to Washington, D.C. with my daughter and she had an iPhone. I, I grabbed it from her and downloaded Hipsomatic app and I started shooting um, pictures in Washington, D.C. And, and there was something about it. I loved it. It was just the iPhone with the Hipstamatic app just photographs the world in a different way than than my professional cameras did. I think it was more compressed. It had more depth of field because I'm I've always been a f 2.8 person where everything is wide open, where all of a sudden now I'm shooting with an iPhone that's f 11. And, and there's just some there was a feel about it where I knew I was being manipulated. So there was, it was a little vignette and, you know, very contrasty. And and like I would accidentally take a photo of my foot and I'd be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. You know, it's like I knew that I was being manipulated, but still there was something about it that I just loved. And so at that point in 2012, I just like went gaga and i got my own iphone i down, download the hipsmatic app and it's really kind of embarrassing now because i get these facebook memories and i'll like post 12 photos in a row on facebook 
uh, you know, from some random day in 2012 and 11 of them have suck. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm surprised anyone followed me at that point. Cause I was just like vomiting, uh, iPhone photos on people. And, you know, and it, it just was like, it was something I had to go through, I guess, but it, it definitely was everything I shot. I thought was a great photo. And so over time I've kind of gotten to a point where I'm a much better editor. Um, but it was, there's still something about it. I love. And I just think it's, you know, one, one thing I do like too, is you can be really stealth. And I can walk down the street wherever I'm at and photograph people without them knowing it and, um, you know, just kind of be in a moment at a bus stop or just walking down the street where it looks like, I, I, you know, I established all this access with these people, but it's just because I'm walking through their moment. And so it definitely is, is you know, is something that really excited me again about photography. And, and it was really easy to share the work and you know, I started doing all these essays for the newspaper with the iPhone and, and then Ben Lowy, he helped develop the Lowy lens and that was less filtered and less vignette And so it kind of was a more, um, journalistic hipstamatic lens. So I started using that one and, and I really enjoyed that, but it's, it's just for me, I think I'm rebelling against myself because I've spent so many years being a newspaper photographer and I show up at an event and people see me with my two cameras. And they know I'm from the newspaper and I know that they're acting differently because they know they're being photographed. And, you know, I have to get people's names and I have, you know, and and it just I just feel like at a certain point where, you know, outside of like sports or something that I'm not really photographing true moments. It wasn't really pure life. It was more kind of this hyper reality where I'm photographing highs and lows and you know, it, it had to be someone crying or laughing or it had to be a funeral or a parade. It couldn't be just daily life. And and so the thing about my street photography is it's just people going through life and, and, you know, they don't know they're being photographed, which people might find creepy or stealth, but for, you know, or, or weird, but I just think it's, it's just the only way to do it. And, and I, I I'm the point now where I just love just how people look and I just want to photograph the in-between moments like I walked around for about an hour before the Golden State Warriors victory parade the other day photographing people waiting for the parade to start and you know and they were just bored or they were just blankly looking and I actually like those photos personally more than you know the ones I took in, during the parade because for me that was real life because as a newspaper photographer we do this all the time we might show up at a protest and it might be a two-hour protest and it's people standing around for an hour and 58 minutes. And then there's two minutes where, you no, know, there's a little fight or people get really excited or agitated. And we photograph that two minutes out of two hours. And then that one photo of that two minute runs in the newspaper as the representation of what happened at a two hour event. And that's total bullshit. That's not what happened at that event. Yeah, that was a moment. It was the most exciting moment, the most dramatic moment. But it wasn't really representative of what actually happened. And so that's what is a newspaper photographer at times kind of when I think about it, you know, it's not the truth because we are cherry picking moments that the, the most exciting and beautiful or, um, you know, emotional to look at. And then we're using that as a representation of what happened. And, and so I think my street photography is more what reality really is. It's people standing on the corner smoking a cigarette or it's just someone waiting for a bus or it's, you know, just someone's face. And, and, I, and, and I love that. And, you know, that's what you know, excites me, but I can't really do that for the newspaper. I can't go to a protest and turn in a photo of someone standing under a tree just being bored, you know, because they'd be like, what the hell is this, you know? And so it's definitely, um, you know, this internal struggle I have at times with photojournalism and, and just newspapers and, and media in general and how we use photographs. And, um, you know, there was the, the big kerfuffle about the photograph um, from Quebec of, of Angela Merkel kind of you know, standing over Donald Trump, you know, and, you know, oh, is this real photojournalism it was shot by an aide, um, you know, one of Merkel's aides or whatever. And it's a, you know, propaganda, but it's also a real moment. And so it's like, you know, when it gets down to it, nothing is, is the truth. You know, everything is a shade of, of the truth, but it's also not true. You know, so it's, it's something, once again, we could go for round and round and round and round and round and round, round for hours. But I feel that my street photography is the truth. Yeah, I am also publishing the most, you know, kind of sexy versions of the truth where the light's nice and the people are interesting, but but it's what people really look like. And, and that's what I love about it. And, and now I'm doing a, my next book is going to be on the Oakland Coliseum, which uh, is just funky rundown stadium with a funky fan base. And they're all just really cool. Oakland is an amazing place. And there was this book um, 
that was photographed in 1977 called Park Life by this photographer named Peter Elliott. And he went to Comiskey Park in Chicago, where I spent so many days of my youth. And he just photographed with a medium format camera of just fans. And this was before like fans would wear jerseys. It was just kind of your slice of life. Um, you know, sometimes they would come from church and stuff. And so it was just this amazing book. So I'm trying to like do a book as an homage to that book um, of the fans at the Oakland Coliseum, because it, sooner or later, they're going to leave that stadium. It's going to be torn down. It's, you know, it's really a dump. And, and so for me, it's like the perfect medium for, you know, the iPhone square, hipstamatic, black and white is the perfect medium for this story. Now, it's, it's not, you know, I think I overdid it for a while where I wanted to do everything with the iPhone. And now I think I'm to the place where I'm kind of cherry picking what I think is best um, for the, the medium and what tool is best for it. And, and sometimes it's not the best tool. And it's definitely something that right now, you know, it's my enthusiasm is waning a little bit for street photography. Like I went out the other day for a couple hours. I didn't make one photo that I wanted to share. You know, it was just, you know, it just kind of, for me, it just was like, eh. you know, but if I go to a new city, um, then I get a little more excited. Like, you know, whenever I go down to LA, I love doing it in LA. If I go back to Chicago, it's fun. So I think maybe I'm just getting a little bored with San Francisco, even though it's a really visual place. You know, I'm a creature of habit. I always do the same walk from the same streets and stuff. So maybe I need to mix it up a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely ebbs and flows, my excitement for it. You know, it definitely is, is, is part of my whole process of staying fresh. And, and I definitely need it. And, you know, maybe someday I'll find something different. Maybe I'll start doing video or drones or whatever. But at this point, you know, I, I'll just stick with the iPhone for now. It does kind of break down the the barrier between between you and the people. That I think that has some has some power to it. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's uh, and and, it, and I've always been lucky enough to work at newspapers that had offices situated in the middle of a vibrant urban area. You know, so I know it's easy for me to to do street photography in Chicago or San Francisco, but you know, someone who works you know, in Topeka, you know, maybe it's not that easy or, you know, it's like I've been in some cities where I was like, oh my God, you know, how in the world am I going to find something to photograph? You know, when there's one person every block. So, so I know I've been, you know, kind of spoiled, um, the cities I've worked in because they've been incredibly visual places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of, speaking of cities, you know, obviously the thing we've kind of alluded to throughout this is, you know, you worked in Chicago area for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, and then, you know, four years ago, you, you moved out to San Francisco. So kind of tell me about the story of, you know, moving out there, your thought process about kind of changing locations, you know, after you've been in, in one place for so long, because I think that's, that's something a lot of people kind of struggle with in finding photography jobs. It's like, do, do I stay connected in my place or do I seek out, you know, opportunities at different, different newspapers, different cities? So I guess speak to that a little bit. Yeah, like like everything else in my life, it's a fluke. It's it was a fluke to get the job in San Francisco. It just was something that the universe presented to me. You know, I was invited to go to the National Geographic seminar, which is every January. It's like an invite only thing. Ooh, foo foo! All the top photographers get to go. You know, and and listen to uh, you know some of the top you know presentations in, in the country. And I love it. You know, it's like all my friends are there. And so after the day long presentations they always have this like happy hour and so i was flittering around being a social butterfly and you know getting a little drunk and and at one point i had to head to the little boys room and as i i'm heading to the bathroom um todd heisler who works at the new york times now but i used to work with him back in chicago um he he was heading out the door he's like oh hey scott um, i'm going out to dinner with a bunch of people i worked at in denver at the rocky mountain news do you want to come with and i'm like yeah absolutely so i went out to dinner and it was him and Sonia Doctorian and um, I think Matt McLean was there. And then um, Judy Walgren, who was one of the editors um, at the paper, was then the director of photography at San Francisco Chronicle. And, and Judy is this amazing force in nature, just uh, super talented and, and just like a super uh, dynamic, balls to the wall, aggressive woman. And, and, you know, I just like I just, you know, loved you know, talking to her. And at some point, you know, after like a couple bottles of wine, she's like, hey, Strazanti, you know, how do you like Chicago? And I'm like, eh, it's OK. I'm getting, you know, a little bit bored. She's like, well, you should come work for me in San Francisco. And I'm like, sure. Sounds great. You know, and and I thought maybe it was just kind of talk over, you know, over wine and stuff. But, you know, she followed up and 
And, you know, it just seemed right. My daughter at the time was a freshman at UCLA and just kind of there were some internal strife and struggles I was having at the Tribune. Nothing major, but it was just something that was bugging me a little bit. So just everything seemed to, to turn on. And, and I, I had relatives in Southern California when I was a kid and I spent a lot of time in California. I love California. And I always thought I would live in L.A. someday. Never thought about the Bay Area. But it just seemed like seemed right. And, and so... You know, that was January of 2014, and I ended up starting in San Francisco in July of 2014. And, you know, it was a big shock. People in Chicago were like, wow, you know, we never thought you'd leave Chicago. The Chicago Tribune used to be a paper that you would go to and you'd retire at. And, you know, and I, I really thought maybe I would someday. I would never leave Chicago because I, I, I love Chicago. And, like, Chicago, I still love Chicago, but people in Chicago love Chicago. It's like it's one of those cities where people who live there just adore their own city, you know. And, and so even though I've traveled the world a ton, you know, I always thought Chicago was one of the best cities in the world, and I still think it is. But when I got to San Francisco, I was just like, oh, okay, this is world class, you know. You know, it has its, you know, San Francisco is – also is a mess at the same time, the homelessness and the mental illness and the drug abuse. And, um, where my office is at the fifth in mission is, you know, just right on the edge of the tenderloin, which people are just littered on the sidewalks. And it, it, it's pretty depressing. And the, and the kind of the, the separation of wealth and poverty is growing every day. And, and so it, it's a really fascinating place to work. It's kind of depressing. Um, but also, you know, I have the luxury now. I live up in Marin County, which is super nice and beautiful. And and so, you know, even though I work in San Francisco, I kind of escape to this like vacation land every day when I go home. And, and so I'm not like living in San Francisco. You know, it definitely gave me a kickstart too. You know, it's like, once again, it's like how many times can you shoot the Bud Billiken parade, you know, like 17 years in a row or something, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you just want to look at something different after a while. And you know, I think I could have stayed in Chicago and been happy, but but I, I definitely needed a career change. And like right now, I have no plans of leaving the Chronicle, but who knows? You know, it's like, you know, I, I kind of feel like eventually I'm going to get kicked out of newspapers just because newspapers, you know, are kind of, you know, getting to the point where, you know, it's just not a viable place to live. And I mean, a viable place to work. And, and especially when you live in the Bay Area, it's like it's so expensive out here. You definitely, I definitely have to supplement my income with kind of just doing whatever I can, you know, like photo walks or, you know, little freelance jobs here and there or, or whatever. I, I doubt I will be at the Chronicle for 13 years like I was at the Chicago Tribune, but who knows? I, I still love newspapers. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of being open to, to opportunity is kind of what it sounds like if I'm hearing right. Yeah, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, mar- I'm going to marry a woman. My fiance is, is like this really someone who is like totally into like, oh, startups and we should, you know, we should monetize your photography more. And I totally agree with her and, you know, just kind of try to figure out a way, you know, to kind of take advantage of my, for lack of a better word, my brand awareness, you know? So it, it's, it's definitely something I'm trying to do more of. And, and when you're, when you're in the Bay area, you just kind of, you kind of, especially here in Marin, it's like all these people who are just like with these big thoughts you know i've always been kind of focused on just my little world my little photography and never thought about you know kind of a, a wider use for it and so you know, i think while i'm at the chronicle now i'm still trying to you know figure out my next step and how to make more money off of my photography and and you know it's, it's, it's a struggle you know it's just like you know people don't want to pay money for photography so it's 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 you know, i know i'm not telling you anything you don't know and so it, it's definitely you know, something that I'm hoping to kind of figure out. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, part of the show is, you know, is talking about the real things of like, yeah, that's, it's tough to tough to do it. You know, the economics of photography are never really been more challenging than, than this. You know, we've been talking about a lot of your work. This is a good a time as ever to say, you know, on photoforward.media, we will have uh, links uh, to uh, shooting from the hip to common ground. So people can take a look at some of these and they are both, uh, let's see, common ground is, is for sale. The book, uh, and shooting from the hip is coming out shortly. Correct. No, actually shooting, shooting the hips out now. And so, you, you know, so that one, um, I have a publisher in Chicago, Warren winter, it's PSG publishing. And so he's, uh, been really great to work with. And, you know, my first book I did with a Kickstarter, my second one, we just kind of pre-sold it, um, on his website. And so, yeah, um, 
you know, it's commongroundthebook.com and shootingfromthehipbook.com. And, you know, definitely, you know, if you just Googled my name, you know, you would be able to find both of them. And, and so, yeah, we'd, we you know, would love to uh, spend a couple more years in San Francisco. So any money that you guys can throw my way would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. People should definitely check those out. And so the last place I want to go uh, is... I saw saw recently some of your work uh, on a, on something called Seventy Two Hours in in Bermuda, uh, and that seems that seems fascinating. I'd love to I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, so so once again, you know, I was getting ready to shoot a, a 49ers game, and and all of a sudden I got a a call from this guy Chuck Fazio, and he said, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm thinking of trying to do this travel tourism photo reality show," and I was asking some of my photo friends, I know I need an iPhone photographer and who's the best iPhone photographer in the world. And so Gary Hirshhorn and uh, John McDonnell, um, who are New York and Washington, D.C., respectively photographers, really amazing guys. And, you know, they recommended, both of them recommended me to Chuck. And so Chuck gave me a call. And and so it's been this kind of long and winding road and been kind of some fits and starts and stuff. But we ended up going down to Bermuda to shoot a pilot for it. Um, a couple months ago, and it, it's it's a really interesting concept. So basically, it's what would be would be me and Chuck um, would come into a city, and it would basically be servicing the tourism bureaus of of a city. Say say the tourism bureau of uh, Denver, you know, would have us come in. Like the first two or three days we were in town, you know, we could do workshops or you know give talks at schools or something. Just kind of do community activities. And then for 72 hours, we would then start um, a photo contest between me and Chuck. And, and, you know, Chuck is a guy who does a lot of drone photography and, you know, he does underwater photography and he's, he's kind of this tourism guy. And where I'm more of this down and dirty photojournalist with my black and white street photography. And so we kind of go off for three days and kind of do our own thing. At the end of the three days, um, there'll be a gallery show and the community could come and and people could kind of vote on what they thought the best photos were. And then so it would be kind of a, you know, an experiential thing for the tourism bureaus in the moment. But then also it'll be photographed as kind of a, a competition, you know, where kind of all our little struggles and heading off and things that happen and funny things and weird things that happen. And then that would end up being um, on a kind of almost like the YouTube channel of, of a, a couple of companies right now. I'm not sure which one that are interested in it. So, so it's definitely uh, like, I think one of those things that could be a future path for me right now, it's just kind of fun. I don't know how I'm going to juggle it with the newspaper job. You know, it's like if I have to take off, you know, six months to do this TV show, it's like, I don't know how that's going to fly, but, but it's definitely something where, you know, it's like we've talked about before, like newspapers has a very hard ceiling of how much money I can make. And I need to find other, you know, income streams. And this definitely would be one. And it would be much more lucrative than my newspaper job. So who knows? It might force me into some decisions that I'm, I didn't think I was going to make at this point. But, but still, it's, it's, it's a fun concept. And it's fun that people who do things like this, you know, recommend me and, and think I'd be good for it. And, and I, I do enjoy talking about photography. And I love kind of proselytizing about it and preaching about it. And so I would love to have that kind of venue to be able to to talk about photography and get people excited about photography you know both one-on-one and also kind of in a broader audience so it definitely has its possibilities i think it's like a 50 50 chance of actually happening um but but it's definitely something that that something like that i think in the future i would like to do Uh, you know i you know it would be wonderful to just kind of travel the world and and get paid to do it and shoot photographs and it would would be a lot of fun well that's that's such a great concept and i think i something about almost kind of community journalism basically you know you have that show at the at the end the gallery show and people come in from and see a part of their city that they probably maybe didn't see especially through the you and chuck's eyes i think that's uh, that's pretty neat yeah yeah it's, you know it's kind of you know it's kind of sort of like you know what mount workshops or you know missouri photo workshops do but a very kind of smaller more you know hopefully personality based um thing because chuck's chuck's a he's a wild card man he's he's funny He's he's a, he's a he's a full of life, so it'll be fun to work with him if we if I can. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm fingers crossed for for you guys for that. I think that I I definitely watch it. <laughs> All right, awesome. 
All right, now we're going to finish today's interview off with a bit of a lightning round sort of series of questions about photography, you know, personal work-life balance, a few quick things here, and then we'll we'll sign off and, and let people know where they can see more of your work. Awesome. All right. What's the one thing in your bag that you don't leave home without? Uh, 50 f1.2 lens. What do you do outside of photography that recharges you? Now I'm doing yoga. I do yoga. I get up every morning at 6 a.m. and do yoga with my girlfriend, and it's amazing. I've never felt better. It's, it's really, you know, if you've never done yoga, you're like, oh, yoga, but it's really great workout, and it's really good for you in many, many, many ways. What drives you and pushes you to be a, a better visual storyteller? Sadly, I think it's uh, I'm an attention seeker. I like the attention, so it's like such a, a bad motivation, but it's still kind of, you know, it goes back to my childhood of like just kind of having older siblings who kind of sucked up all the bandwidth of my parents. And, you know, I just need I need people to look at my work. So it's you know, I know that there's benefits to it. And I know that, you know, it's like it's it's a flaw that is a positive flaw. You know, like it, it doesn't hurt anyone and it's good for a lot of people. But it's still, I think at its heart, it's kind of a little a little bit uh, unhealthy. <laughs> there's no no shame in that. Having a, a little bit of an ego is a good thing, I think. And last, what advice would you give to a student graduating from university that wants to pursue a career in, in news or photography? I hope at this point you'd take business classes and, you know, it's like, it's something, the business side of my career is something that I ignored for a long, long time. And it's something that, that I, I wish I wouldn't have. And so of course, you know, photograph as much as you can and, and, you know, try to have personal projects, but when it comes down to it, try to find a way to make money off of it. And, and you know, and if you can't just have it be a hobby. It's a real, it's the real world. Yes. So where can people see more of your work online uh, and where can they connect with you? All right. Well, pretty much everything's my name. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's at Scott Strazanti. And, um, you know, the easiest way probably is just to, you know, put my name in the old Googler and everything will pop up right away. And, and I am totally open for people reaching out to me. Uh, my email is strazanti at sfchronicle.com. If you have any questions or you just want to you know, show me some work, I just love talking with people about photography. If you want to do something more formal, you know, I offer mentoring services for a, a slight fee. And uh, so I, I enjoy trying to help photographers with their long term projects or just kind of getting out of a rut. So that's something, too. So it's like whatever you need. I'm kind of like a full service photo guy. So uh, be more than happy to do stuff, whatever you need. Just you know, reach out to me. And I, I just love the interaction. Well, oh, that's that's really generous. Thanks. Thanks so much, Scott. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, we covered a lot of a lot of common ground here and uh, <laughs> look forward to, to hopefully talking more in the future. Sounds awesome, man. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, Scott. Enjoying listening to the Photo Forward podcast? Want to hear more thought provoking, creative visual storytellers? Well, this is where you come in. We want to get the word out as wide as possible about Photo Forward and reach as many listeners as possible. And the best way to do that is through reviews and recommendations on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume your podcasts. If you want to support more deep dive conversations with photographers, videographers, and storytellers the world over, head on over to the Photo Forward page on iTunes and drop a review or even a rating. It means a ton to growing the show, and I personally read through each and every review to make this show the best damn visual storytelling podcast out there. So, as always, keep seeing, keep shooting, and keep putting your best photo forward. See you all soon.